You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network, and I am not Carrie Lutz. I'm Bill Powers. I'm a good friend of Carrie and fellow podcaster. And I'm filling in for Carrie today because over the past week, uh, he had a bout with uh, the dreaded COVID. So it was uh, qu- looking quite serious. Uh, at one point in time, he was in the hospital, but I'm happy to report that Carrie is now out of the hospital. He's back at home. So he pulled through and he will be back uh, behind his microphone in short order, uh, progressing with uh, the usual line of guests and quality content that you expect from the Financial Survival Network. One of those weekly guests is John Rubino over at dollarcollapse.com. So John, welcome onto the show. It's my pleasure to guest host. And I know that Kerry is expecting to be behind his microphone next week to have a conversation with you, but welcome onto the show. Hey, Bill. Well, it's good to finally meet you. And uh, I'm, I'm glad Carrie's OK. You know, I'm I'm a little bit worried that I jinxed him because a couple of days before he got sick, I, I was talking to somebody and I was complaining. I, You know, I was saying, I know this is a real virus and everything, but I have literally not met or heard of anybody that I know who's been in the hospital over this thing, you know? So how serious can it be? Two days later, Carrie gets sick. So, you know, the universe works that way. You gotta be careful about uh, how arrogant you sound because because uh, it'll put you in, its, in, in your place. Yes, and it, the virus became very real and personalized for me, just texting with Carrie multiple times a day and uh, hearing about his physical struggle, which I'm sure he's gonna be sharing his firsthand account uh, with you, his listeners, when he gets back behind the mic. But John, as you and I chat, gold and silver are off to a phenomenal start in the new year. And it seems like we're in melt up mode. I don't even know if it's, is this risk on, is this risk off? What is occurring in the markets right now? Well, volatility is occurring in the markets right now. Gold and silver spiked this morning. Stocks opened at record levels and then tanked. Um, over the weekend, Bitcoin went uh, went up to like um, $33,000, then down to $27,000, and then back up to $31,000. So there's a lot of money sloshing around out there in various things, trying to figure out where to go. And I, I think the, you know, the short-term dynamic, well, there, there are several. One is... Um, that this is a good seasonal time for precious metals. You know, January and February are generally the two best months because of Asian buying. Asian people have their weddings in the spring and they like to give gold and silver as gifts. Um, so the Asian jewelers have to do a lot of gold and silver buying in um, December and January and February. Um, and, and there's also the, um, the stimulus issue. Because what what has been happening for the past few years is that the um, you know the financial markets, which are basically stimulus junkies now, you know they are addicted to ever increasing easy credit, and um, they they do well when they think that's what's coming. In other words, when there's a new stimulus plan out there waiting to hit the markets, uh, stocks go up and bonds do well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as soon as they think there's gonna be any kind of a delay or there's no real timetable for the next big shot of monetary heroin, they start to flake out. And uh, that, you know, that happened in um, early 2020, it happened in late 2018, and uh, you know, where the stock market just tanked and that causes the government to cave and, and hurry up that new stimulus. So we're, we're back in that place again, I think, where we did a stimulus plan which was you know nine hundred billion dollars, which is pocket change in today's world, uh, and the market got that and was happy leading into the the enactment of that that plan. But now um, stock traders are looking ahead and thinking, you know, the next one's going to be hard to do, especially if the Republicans hold the Senate, which we'll find out this week whether that's true or not. Because if they do, then we're going to have a divided government. Um, it's going to be very hard to get through another big stimulus plan like that. So we might not get our next shot for a long time. And, and so the stock market is tanking. Um, and so you've got all these cross currents out there where there's still lots of money in the system. But uh, people who look ahead six months and base their investment decisions on what the next six months looks like, they're nervous. 
Um, so we could easily see a stock market crash in the next few weeks, you know, and, and that forces the government's hand and then we get more stimulus and then stocks take off again. But I, I think in the short run, the market is extremely risky. And then it becomes a question of whether that pulls down gold and silver too, because normally when stocks tank, um, everything else goes down. People sell the things that they can raise cash with, which includes gold and silver, so gold and silver tank too. That's what happened in, in March of this year, brutally. And it could easily happen again this spring. So this is an iffy time for every kind of financial and real asset. But even so, you want to be in the real assets just on principle. You know, if if this is, if, you know, if you have a lot of profits in the stock market, it makes sense at this point in the cycle to be taking some of those profits and moving them into real things that government can't just inflate away with a mouse click. And that means gold and silver, um, really well chosen rental houses, really well chosen farmland, maybe some energy assets, stuff like that, um, that can't just be created out of thin air. So the investment. Um, thesis that has been reasonable for the last few years is still in place. It's just that there's going to be a lot of volatility in the next few months until we figure out, you know, what kind of a government we have and what their attitude is going to be towards never ending stimulus. John, for those that aren't as concerned about the increasing debt and the debasement of the currency and aren't proponents of gold and silver honest money like yourself, they could point out to someone like you or me or Carrie and say, well, listen, you guys have been on this same theme since 2008. It's been 12, 13 years. The markets are trending higher. You know, what would have been my opportunity cost if I actually took your advice? So you're sitting down with this person. How confident are you that we're going to see a major market crash in 2021? And how would you convince them if they had this perspective? Well, um, you're right. You know, we've been saying this for a long time. And um, this system has held on a lot longer than seemed possible. So really, I, I don't have a lot of credibility when it comes to timing, because I really did think that I frankly thought that the tech stock bubble bursting in 2000 would be the end of the fiat currency slash fractional reserve banking system. And then I was convinced that the housing bubble bursting in 2007, 2008, 2009 would have to be the end of it. So yeah, we, we've been able via central bank printing presses to keep this thing going much longer than it should have been able to go, but at the cost of in, insane amounts of new debt. You know, we keep piling on new debt, uh, you know, new a new mountain of debt on top of an old mountain of debt, and it's not ending. So at some point this blows up, and yes, we can't say when, but um, 2021 is a big decision year because of the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but really because of our reaction to it. In other words, these global lockdowns have basically bankrupted huge sectors of the, the economy in the US and elsewhere so that they need bailouts this year to avoid just ending. You know, the uh, the hotel industry could just evaporate, the airline industry, um, most other hospitality industries, state and local finances are a catastrophe right now. And they're gonna have to lay off half the cops, half the teachers, half the firefighters in, in a lot of big cities and in a lot of states, um, unless a huge amount of money comes in from the federal government. So all of that stuff is kind of coming to a head this year. And if you are a stock market investor, you have to decide whether um, you want to ride the inevitable wave of new liquidity, which may not be a bad strategy because um, that's what worked for the past 15 years or 20 years when uh, you know nothing else should have worked, but that did work. So you know it could be again that um, the, the government comes in with another. $10 trillion and that elevates financial asset prices. But it comes at a risk if you're in these markets because um, if, it, if it doesn't work out perfectly, in other words, if the government doesn't come in with tons of new money and that does not cause a currency crisis in which everybody loses faith in the dollar and the euro and the end because we're creating so many of those currencies, <clears throat> you know, if, if that all doesn't work out for you, then the stock market could be extremely volatile, at least, and possibly um, just collapse. Because if, let's say, we, we get that final currency crisis where the dollar does collapse, interest rates will go up in that kind of an environment. 
And rising interest rates make stocks look dramatically less interesting because you're comparing stock dividends to instead of, you know, 0% interest rates to maybe six, seven, 8% interest rates on bonds. Um, so you've got a huge amount of risk embedded in the stock market right now. Um, and the question is, do you want to accept that risk in return for potential big gains on top of the big gains that you generated already? Um, or do you want to hide out in safe haven assets that are, by the way, doing well too? You know, gold has done as well as stocks since 2000. So in this century, um, you could have just as easily been in gold and made money with a lot less risk than in the S&P 500. Um, so do you want to be in safe haven assets like that, that will protect you to the downside if all of this volatility comes to pass? Or do you want to roll the dice with stocks? And, uh, you know, I, I personally, it makes a lot more sense to, uh, to be moving into things that governments can't inflate away when their goal is clearly to inflate away their currencies in order to get out from under their past bad debts. So I, I think gold and silver are smarter places to be, although they may not be the only things that make people a lot of money going forward, but they, they do it at a better risk reward calculus than a lot of other assets. John, there's a lot of forecasts and speculating regarding what a dollar collapse, uh, how that would come about, what that would look like for society, and what economic system would rise out of the ashes. Um, when that takes place, whenever that's going to be, I thought it would have been by now already, going back to Lehman Brothers. Do you have any concerns about stocks you own, brokerage accounts, and your ownership, and will that transfer over to whatever system emerges on the other side of the ashes of a dollar collapse? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Today's show is brought to you by Mistango River Resources. Their flagship projects are located in Kirkland Lake, an established gold camp that has historically produced over 70 million ounces of gold. The Kirkland West project is a high-grade gold project beside Kirkland Lake Gold's world-class Mikasa Gold Mine, one of the highest-grade mines in the world. The Umeja project is an advanced-stage project with 600,000-plus ounces of gold along the Cadillac Break, 25 kilometers kilometers east of Mikasa. Their projects have the potential to transform into another world-class mining camp in the Kirkland Lake District. Make sure you go over to mistango.com, that's M-I-S-T-A-N-G-O.com, take a look and sign up for notifications. Stock is traded on the Canadian Stock Exchange, ticker symbol M-I-S. For more information and to sign up for notifications, go to mistango.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Yeah, the kind of chaos that can ensue from this financial system breaking down is, you know, multifaceted and terrifying. There are a lot of bad things could happen. And one of the bad things that could happen is that there are disruptions in the functioning of the financial system so that you can't get at what you've got in a brokerage account or an online banking account. Uh, you know, they, they close the banks in financial crises frequently uh, throughout history. You know, the U.S. did it for weeks during the Depression. Um, and uh, banking systems have shut down in other countries in, more recently during financial crises. So there's no reason to think that that can't happen. I mean, I, I wouldn't specifically predict that, but it's certainly a possibility based on history uh, and based on the amount of debt that we've taken on, which means the crisis has to be commensurately huge when it comes. Um, so yeah, if you have all your money accessible only online, you are taking a big risk. And then you got to um, fold in the um, the cyber crime, cyber war angle to all this, because if we get into any kind of a fight in the world with China or Russia, let's say, uh, one of the battlefields in that fight will be um, cyberspace, where if apparently, we all have the ability to shut down each other's banking systems and um, power grids. <laughs> so, you know, if this gets serious, it's completely possible that somebody shuts down big chunks of the banking system and the brokerage houses and stuff like that. So um, obviously, you can't avoid having some of your money accessible only online. You know, that's that's unrealistic in this world. But at the same time, you uh, you might want to have a, a fair chunk of your assets in 
physical things like gold and silver coins, for instance, you know, to go back to the, uh, the kind of prepping angle here, you want to be as self-sufficient as possible in terms of your food supply and your self-defense and your money. You know, it's good to have some real money accessible on hand, no matter what else is going on out there in the world. Um, and it's also good to diversify among financial accounts. You know, don't have all your money. I, we were talking about uh, before we went live, how I used to have money in three different brokerage accounts of uh, Schwab, Options Express, and TD Ameritrade. And then Schwab bought Options Express, folded all my accounts with them into Schwab. And now they're buying TD Ameritrade, you know? So, so I'm, I'm getting way too concentrated and have to figure out how to diversify out. I've got to move some money to, to some other brokerage account that isn't Schwab just in case, you know? So you, you've got to do all of those things. It's, it's not enough to, uh, to just pick the right investments in this world. You know, um, that's a big part of it, obviously, but then you got to decide where to keep those investments and how to protect them from, non-market related disruptions. In other words, you, you buy something and it goes up in value, that's great. But if you can't get to it because your brokerage house is offline, that's terrible, you know, and you need to take all those possibilities into account. Um, this is a much more complicated world than it used to be. And it's only gonna get more complicated and you can't avoid thinking about this stuff because not deciding is still a decision, right? So you you have to think about how you want to protect yourself against lots of different risks instead of just the, oh, I bought this and it went down kind of risk. So life is complicated <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it. So we really have to think this stuff through and, and take the steps that at least give us a chance of holding on to a decent chunk of our wealth when things really hit the fan here. And when you hold uh, physical gold and silver in your own possession, there still is risk. There's protection risk. A, a thief could break in and mm -hmm. steal or could be taken by force from a government or uh, somebody that has evil intentions towards you. And that's often pointed out to me by the proponents of Bitcoin, who says this is a store of value and it's outside the government system. Would you agree with that, John? Do you think it has some overlapping functions as the physical precious metals in our own possession do? Um, yeah, very possibly. I, I don't completely understand the dynamic of the cryptocurrency market. In other words, why Bitcoin and why not Ethereum? And um, how do you calculate the supply of cryptos um, if you can create as many new ones as you want? And is Bitcoin this kind of separate asset within that category that is going to be immune to supply and demand issues even when uh, people are moving money out of Bitcoin to buy cheaper cryptos like a Litecoin or something? You know, I, I don't understand those dynamics well enough to, uh, to offer any kind of definitive opinion about this. But yeah, Bitcoin seems to be treated in the market as a store of value uh, but to the uh, to the extent that you've got your bitcoin in an online wallet let's say or an etf uh, then then you are still subject to the same risks as if you've got mining stocks in a charles schwab account or something like that so it can be hacked you know and and the internet itself can go down or the entity um, where you're holding your Bitcoin can go bust, like Matt Gox did a while ago. You know, there have been some, some big Bitcoin wallets that turned out to be frauds or turned out to be hackable or something like that. So, so you've got to take all that into account too with cryptos, just like you do with stocks. So um, I love the concept of um, private sector technology-based money that is not subject to regulation and inflation by out of control governments. Love the concept, but I don't understand the technical side of this well enough to, um, to make, for instance, Bitcoin or Ethereum a, a big chunk of my portfolio. I own some, but uh, more um, just as a way of keeping my hand in, you know, being involved in this dynamic market. But I, I don't go into that with the kind of understanding that I feel like I have with uh, gold, silver and the junior mining stocks, for instance. You know, I feel like I get the dynamics in those markets. So I'm comfortable owning more of those than I am comfortable owning, say, Bitcoin. Um, but for somebody who feels like they have a really good understanding of that market, then I think there are a lot of advantages um, in something like a crypto that governments can't get at very easily. Oh, and there is the other um, 
actually the government angle in the crypto market where, um, you know, they, they changed the designation of one called XRP just lately and that, and it tanked. And the idea that they can't just declare a given cryptocurrency to be a security rather than a commodity or uh, just make it illegal, I think is giving governments too much credit or too little credit, depending on how you, uh, you look at it. You know, they, uh, when they panic, they're going to do all kinds of irrational things. And some of that will be directed at cryptos if cryptos grow into a tangible threat for existing fiat currencies. So I think you have to take into account, you know, the empire strikes back scenario in all of this, where <clears throat> the US or China or Europe will try to do something out of their, their own insecurity that affects cryptos and limits the risk that cryptos pose to existing fiat currencies. And that might affect the market value of cryptos. And I, again, I, you know, there's a lot of possibilities there. I don't know how it would play out, but I think it's a risk that you have to take into account when you're looking at something like Bitcoin. Yeah, that makes sense. John, before you go, I'd like to get your thoughts on what you think will be the best performing asset when we look back 365 days from now on 2021. In my personal portfolio, I am highly leveraged up on junior silver miner producers, developers and explorers. That's where I'm placing my greatest bet. But second behind that, I might like to bet on volatility, just buy some call options on some of these uh, volatility ETFs. Uh, where, what do you think might be the best performing in this year? Well, volatility, volatility is a certainty. So yes, if, you, uh, if you're technically sophisticated enough to put a good volatility bet on, I think you'll do fine. <laughs> Unless, um, you know, the, the price of volatility is already so high because everybody else has made that decision and, and then you're paying way up for that bet. Uh, but yeah, volatility is, is a given. Silver looks pretty spectacular because it wins either way. Um, if, um, if we have a divided government and that causes extreme volatility to the downside in the stock market, which forces the government to come back with another big stimulus plan, good for precious metals, silver will be swept along in that. If we have a Democrat controlled government, um, with the, which has a, a very big, um, um, plan for the environment. In other words, they, they enact some version of the, uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, and that's good for silver too, because silver is an industrial metal that is used in electric cars and solar panels and lots of other things that relate to the transition away from fossil fuels and towards solar, wind, biofuels, other things like that. So there could be a, a huge shortage of silver, either from investment demand or industrial demand or both going forward. And it's such a thin market that you, you can see silver um, finally go to 100 bucks an ounce very easily in this market. You know, you saw what happened with Bitcoin just lately. Bitcoin is about the size of silver of the silver market. Um, so money you know, comparable amounts of money flowing into silver um, to the, what flowed, flowed into Bitcoin in the last year could send silver up, you know, double or triple or quadruple from where it is now. And that, like you said, that would take the little miners through the roof. You know, they become lottery tickets in this scenario where, um, you know, if it's a, a $3 a share junior silver miner right now, it could be a $20 a share mid-tier <laughs> in a year or two. Uh, so, yeah, I like silver. I like the, um, the, the related miners very much. And I think they are actually fairly low risk because, as I said, silver tends to win either way going forward which makes these miners, um, you know, potentially just huge winners in the next year or two. Yes, excellent. That's what I'm betting on. John's website, I'm sure you're already familiar with it, but to say it again, it's dollarcollapse.com. John, thanks for coming on Financial Survival Network. And I know Carrie's planning on speaking to you next week in my steed. Thanks, Bill. See ya. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.